Hey there, Netrunners, and people who probably have no idea what Netrunning is. We got a new Most Wanted list! <laughs> and yeah, okay, I know that happened a bit ago, and I'm a tad late to the party where we drink sweet, delicious Astro Tears. <laughs> got some things I'd like to discuss about the new update. Not that I have any problems with it, I'm actually extremely satisfied with pretty much the whole thing, and not to brag, but almost everything I thought was going to happen, happened. And I'm not here to say I told you so, or rub it in NBN players' faces. Oh, who am I kidding? Can I see that clip again? But r really, seriously, what what is what is this video for? What what is all this nonsense anyway? Well, this nonsense is to take a bit of a deeper look into the reasonings of the MWL and FAQ updates, and try to make sure that the state of the game and its meta is understood as something a bit deeper than just I don't like that thing, so let's pseudo ban it. Now, don't get me wrong, the things that are now on the most wanted list do need to go sit in a corner and think about what they've done. But what needs to be understood in order for the community and the game to grow and evolve properly is that just because something is strong, or because you lost to it, or because you don't like playing against it, that doesn't necessarily make it overpowered or unhealthy. The idea the idea here is to better explain what makes a certain card or deck or playstyle actually warping or de degenerate for the game, rather than just trying to gather a witch hunt ban for whatever card you don't happen to like. That way we can all have better understanding of the game and to be able to recognize what just needs to be played around and what needs to actually be nerfed. So, let's start off the MWL discussion with the giant orange elephant in the room, Anarchs. Or, more specifically, the infamous Dumblefork suite of Faust, David, and the Wildcakes combo. As we all know, three of these four cards have been put on the list, and it's no mystery that Faust was the poster boy of overpowered degenerate decks for the runner side. But, did he really deserve all the hate he got? Not really, or at least not Faust all by himself. See, when all by his lonesome, Faust actually isn't a problem at all. He is an AI, but like all the other AIs in the game, his extremely high flexibility of being able to break all kinds of ice is mitigated by an extremely high cost to power him. Discarding entire cards out of your hand to give the effect of what would normally only cost you one or two credits is a pretty high trade-off. And the idea of being able to use a different but still very valuable resource other than credits is a pretty good mechanic and kind of Anarch's thing. So, what's the problem? The problem is that Faust's intended drawbacks and high costs are being totally negated by the assistance of Wild Cakes and David. The Wild Cakes combo gives a totally passive two-card draws a turn, which in and of itself is an absurdly powerful combo that probably should be on the MWL even without Faust's help. But by getting an extra two cards a turn, you are not only increasing your Faust ammo by 40% for doing literally nothing, but you're also negating the drawback that you would normally have to spend clicks to draw cards. Thus, fueling Faust would not only cost you the options that the cards you toss would have given you, but also the time out of your turn getting the gas in the first place. Now, this could even still be played around by simply having huge ice with high power and or lots of subroutines, except that for a mere three credits, Anarchs also have access to D4V1D, which effortlessly handles anything Faust would normally have struggled against, and in and of itself is capable of saving the runner what would normally be a huge pile of credits in exchange for relatively very little investment. Combine all of this with the ID of Wizard, and the runner is sitting on not one, not two, but three different and extremely efficient ways to totally circumvent the concept of needing credits, meaning that the runner 
almost doesn't even have to concern themselves with managing their own resources at all, and that is a problem. But even then, it still wasn't the biggest problem. Beyond that, there was something even more disruptive to the meta lurking on the horizon. The real, true root of the problem, and that, and the reason is that all three of those cards were added to the MWL instead of just one or two of them, is that Anarchs had a core balance issue where they had all the answers. They were like the agents in the Matrix. They had a perfect, easy-to-use, in-faction solution for anything the Corp could use to counter their combo. Sure, the Corp has things like Swordsman and Wraparound, Turing, Elizabeth Mills, Koma Inu, Power Shutdown, and whatever else you got, but the fact is that the court player will very likely have to spend influence splashing those answers into their deck. Meanwhile, Anarchs had perfect counters to those counters already in-house, with Mimic, Corroder, David, Data Sucker, Ice Destruction, and even if you did manage to get ahead and blow up some of their pieces, just to rub it in, they had free recursion like Deja Vu and Retrieval Run just to get it right back. Because of this, just putting one or two of the problem cards on the list was not going to hurt the deck as much as it should have, because they have so many in-faction answers that restricting their influence doesn't have the effect on them that it normally should have. So in order to truly weaken the overpowered Faust suite, all of the cards in question had to be restricted, forcing influence decisions to actually matter again. Now, this may not necessarily mean that Ding Dong the Dumble Fork is dead, but it should certainly have taken a big enough chunk out of it that its power and consistency have gone down enough that it should be much less of a problem than it was before. Phew, okay, done with that topic. Now, on to the other side of the card table. We've got, uh, breaking news that NBN has to spend influence something to balance Jhow. Uh, Mumba Temple plus Mumba City Hall was too much damn econ for too little effort. Punitive counter food, yada yada yada. Astro Train is dead, people! And yes, I understand, there were some people who thought Faster when EH was totally fair and balanced, but they've already been beaten to death, so we're fine. But, really, really now, for real, what was the problem with AstroScript? Well, a couple of things. First of all, let's just do some basic comparison. AstroScript Pilot Program has reigned over Netrunner as the number one undisputed most powerful agenda in the entire game for literally the entire history of the game until just now. And it should be clear from a glance that AstroScript was the only 3-2 agenda in the entire game that was pure benefit with no downside and no extra effort of any kind. Take a look at any other 3-2 agenda in the game. They all come with some kind of downside or risk, or require over-advancing in order to get their benefit. For example, Jinteki has Brain Trust, which requires over-advancing and is rarely even done. It has Philotic Entanglement, which is pure value, but it's limited to one per deck, so it has a downside. Project Atlas, Project Beal, Project Vitruvius all require over-advancing. Accelerated Beta Test is still very, very powerful, yes, but at high-level play is rarely procced because of the risk of tossing free agendas to the runner and helping them win the game. Merger has a massive downside that makes nobody want to touch it with a 10-foot pole and is why it can't get a date to prom. So, again, Astra was the only 3-2 agenda in the game that was pure 100% profit. But not just any profit, mind you. The kind that lets you score agendas out of hand the instant you draw them. This kind of interaction is extremely unfun and unhealthy for the game, as it created a very negative feeling of lack of interaction between the players. The kind that crosses the line from, there was something I should have done there, to, there was nothing I could have done there. This is actually even still okay, to a degree, when it happens a small number of times or is caused by big, obvious, expensive threats like Sand Sand City Grid and Biotic Labor, which can be seen coming and played around. But when a deck 
revolves around that mechanic for a huge part of its playstyle, any deck that isn't running tons of R&D multi-access and the econ to lock it down every single turn has to just sit there helplessly while the corp just goes two-pointer instantly mine, two-pointer instantly mine, two-pointer instantly mine, draw to one, that's game. Combine that with the huge pile of free accelerant that is NEH's constant free draw and inexplicable 17 influence, and it's no surprise that that ID was engulfing at least half of the top eight decks and tournaments, for quite some damn time. But even then, the real crime of Astroscript is something that the MWL doesn't even address at all. The true threat of Astro is in its breaking of the unwritten rules of the game, specifically a magic word called thresholds. Astro was so powerful and so abusable because it drew its OPness from breaking the threshold of how the game is normally balanced and meant to operate. You can see this in other card games like Magic the Gathering. There are certain numbers that are inherently made difficult to reach. For example, how you can do 2 or 3 damage with a single mana, but when you want to do 4 damage, thereby breaking the threshold of what is generally considered a durable creature, suddenly you have to fulfill weird conditions or pay several times more mana, or lose options in what the spell can target. Astroscript broke the unwritten threshold of scoring an agenda worth more than one point without letting it be on the table for at least one turn, thus giving the runner at least one opportunity to steal it or at least learn something about their opponent's playstyle and board state. Again, with Fast Advance being NBN's trademark thing, it's not completely negative that it exists, but at three Astros per deck there was just way too damn much of it. Okay, almost done here, people. Almost done. Now, last but not least, we have approached the titan leaning over the wall. The dark figure hiding in the shadows. Industrial genomics. Or, more accurately, Museum of History. Or, more accurately than that, the daunting new corp deck archetype that is prison decks. Now, I am... Totally fine with Museum just being eroded to being a special snowflake now, because while it is very irritating to play against, it really isn't as overpowered and ban worthy as some people are bitch, I mean, claiming it is. It's not really unbalanced, it's just unfun. Granted, this can be just as bad, but I'm going to play devil's advocate a bit here and say that while I don't enjoy playing against prison decks as much as the next guy, they do have a place in the game and in the meta, and they do have a right to exist as a viable strategy. Why? Well, because when you get down to it, what what is IG really for the game? Well, in my opinion, Prison IG is really just Netrunner's equivalent of The Deck. That's right, The Deck. What the hell is that? Well, The Deck was the name of an infamous, nefarious, incredibly powerful deck from a very long time ago in Magic the Gathering. In reality, it was really just Magic's first really strong, competitively viable, blue-white control deck. And everyone freaked the hell out about it because a control deck that strong hadn't really been seen before. So, when I see Prison IG, what I really see is Netrunner's version of its first real blue-white control deck. And nobody likes playing against it, just like in Magic, nobody likes playing against decks with 500 life gain and 20 counterspells, but the archetype deserves to exist. However, the birthing pains of this deck style seem to have the issue that they exist in an environment that currently has very few natural predators. While in Magic, a control deck has to be particularly strong to become competitively viable, in Netrunner, it seems more like a prison deck just has to be a prison deck. Granted, IG Prison isn't crushing any tournaments or winning any trophies, but it is making players irritable as they have to get their grandkids to finish the game for them. The real issue, as best as I can tell, is that the card design has simply not given us enough accessible options to deal with prison-type strategies. Magic has anti-life gain and uncounterable spells, 
but right now Netrunner has not none, but not enough reliable options for the average player to handle prison decks without feeling they have to spend influence to slot cards in from a small list of hate tech. Granted, it could also be that players just haven't adjusted to learning how to play against this new type of opponent. Given some time and some new developments in the meta, it may become more common knowledge on how to deal with these types of threats without having to warp your deck around dealing with it. Just make sure before you say something is truly broken or banworthy that you have exhausted the different angles you could look at the problem from instead of just doing the same thing you were always doing and complaining when it doesn't work anymore. All in all, though, I have to say I am extremely satisfied with the new Most Wanted List in FAQ update, and I'm also super hyped about the extremely fun-looking new Flashpoint cycle. Netrunner was, admittedly, in a bit of a rough spot there, but a little bit of faith in the designers can go a long way, and they certainly turn things around. Here's to more running, less pilot programs, and lots of interesting decks and exciting matches in the bright and near future of Android Netrunner. Thank you and good night, nerds.